My name is Christine Reach. I've been at the Museum of Science for 20 years. Um, during that time period, I've been a researcher, I've been an exhibit developer, and now I'm an administrator. Um, and so I've had various roles, and I've always been looking at the inclusion um, of the learning experiences that we've produced at the museum, particularly our exhibits. And as I mentioned, particular focus on people with disabilities, but I've looked at this more broadly as well. I've also studied the structures that pose barriers towards inclusion at other museums across the nation, both art museums and science museums. And so I'm just going to talk about those a little bit today. I'll start with the story about how the inclusion of people with disabilities came about at the Museum of Science. Because I think it's an important one, because it, it's when you start doing the inclusion work that your structural barriers become the most evident. So in the mid-1980s, a close friend still and mentor of mine, Betty Davidson, was volunteering at the Museum of Science. She's a wheelchair user, um, PhD in biochemistry, and always felt that her life was a um, pervasive message of not for you. Everywhere she went, she was always told this is not for you because it wasn't designed to be inclusive for her. And as a volunteer at the Museum of Science, she really wanted to change that environment so that other children who were coming to the Science Museum would see that science is for them. And so she approached um, the administration at the museum and said, we'd like to make, um, I'd like to make your exhibits more inclusive of people with disabilities. And they said, well, we don't really have the funding for that. Um, she also looked at it and um, they said, well, what would you do? And she goes, I don't, I'm, I don't really know yet, right? No one had really done this work in science museums. And so there was no funding. She didn't really know how to do the work. And the work that was happening already in the museum was viewed through a charity lens. We're gonna do some additional programming. We'll have some additional exhibits on the sides that are just for them, right? So separate charity for others um, was the framing. And she, went to the National Science Foundation and applied for a grant um, to change out one of our exhibit areas that is traditional um, natural history museum exhibit with um, dioramas. So it's just glass cases, bears, moose, beaver, birds. Walk in, you look at them, really long labels, and you walk out. What her work showed um, when she changed the exhibit to be more inclusive of people with disabilities is that the experience became better for everyone. She shortened the text and worked with um, people who are deaf for whom English is often not their first language, it's often ASL. Um, she worked with them to change the text to make it more readable. She brought in um, people who are blind and asked them, what do you care about when it comes to the natural world? And they said, we have no idea what a bear looks like. How would you if you're sensing the world through touch? Um, it's not very often that you're approaching a bear and be like, hello, bear, what do you look like? I'm going to feel your face. Um, and so they had only ever experienced things like teddy bears, which don't at all look like bears. And so um, they said, we need a, a tactile model of a bear. And so she worked with the New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife Service to get roadkill um, that we could then, free, and we still, 30 years later, have this um, partnership, um, that we could then taxidermy on a regular basis to have a touchable bear mount. Um, she also added in interactives and um, lowered the heights of most things to increase the visibility for people in wheelchairs. And a summative evaluation found that all these changes combined um, not only made science accessible for people with disabilities, but also um, increased the amount of time spent by everyone in the gallery, increased the number of people who understood the main messages of the gallery from 20 to over 95% of the public, and also um, those of you who are familiar with the importance of this in informal science learning, the conversation increased in the gallery. And that's one of the key methods by which learning takes place is through family conversations. So her barriers, no funding, she overcame it by getting a grant. Um, not knowing how to do the work, she overcame it by partnering with um, people with disabilities and engaging in experimentation to figure out what would work. And the barrier of that narrative of it's for others um, was overcome by purposefully working with George Hine, who was the evaluator, to study this idea that it's not just for a few, but it's really 
about everyone. And so that's a way that um, our organization kind of if overcame those barriers. It makes it sound like a simple story. There's then another 15 years of continuing to advocate for the work, bringing me in, um, me continuing to advocate for the work for another 20. Um, and so that's, that's one story. Another story is not so positive, and it's um, a colleague of mine at another museum who really felt passionately around inclusion, and she worked a lot with teens um, in an urban area. And she wanted to bring in, she worked a lot with multicultural teens um, and used teens as ambassadors for science for the communities that were traditionally not feeling welcome. And it was a very successful program. And she then wanted to extend this out to also include um, high school students with disabilities. And she ran into two structural challenges. One was transportation. There was a teen that wanted to work at the museum, um, but the museum, even though it was in an urban area, didn't have great public transportation, and so she, this teen needed to rely on um, the, the ride service that was in the area for people with disabilities. If any of you have ever worked with people with disabilities and have tried to work in your urban ride service, it is a huge structural problem. It is unreliable. Um, and so she had this teen that would show up for work two hours late because sometimes the service wouldn't pick her up. Or even worse for the staff, this team would get stranded at the museum post-closing hours for over two hours. And then the staff didn't want to leave a teen alone, and so they were also working well into the night. So a major structural problem of just transportation within our cities. Another structural problem is that she tried to work with a teen who um, was deaf and um, an ASL speaker. And um, there's supposed to be services um, for people who, um, sign language services, that you can bring in in such settings. The sign language interpreters were never available. Um, and they could never bring in a sign language interpreter. So she went about it and started to use the teen who is deaf to teach the other teen sign language. And then they could all kind of learn together um, how to interpret with the public. But that, as Angie pointed out earlier, relied on a structure of one person. So it's not really a structural change, right? It's a short-term fix. Once that teen left, it wasn't sustainable with future teens. And so those are kind of two stories. And what's really important is that what I've learned over time is that you have these internal structural barriers, which oftentimes can be overcome with a lot of hard work, but by using and leveraging um, those kind of external um, agencies like the NSF, partnerships with different community groups that can make your, your organization more inclusive. But there's also um, those external barriers, and those are the biggest ones to fix. Um, even at the Museum of Science, we work hard around this narrative of you know, lifting all rising tides, lift all boats, right? And so we focus on that narrative. Whenever we hire new people, it's a whole indoctrination again of saying, I've been talking about the importance of this work, um, changing the narrative to get it back, because that broader narrative isn't omnipresent in our broader culture. Um, you know, also fixing transportation. There was one museum that worked for a year to advocate for an auditory signal in front of its crosswalk so that people who are blind could get in. Um, but that's a lot of work. And so as organizations, we find that what we need to do to do this work is collaborate together, and continually advocate. And so as organizations and individuals, we need to be working not just on our own practices, not just on our organization's practices, but the broader practices overall. What's interesting, too, is that external forces can lead to positive changes inside as well, if we are open and embracing those structures. So I'm really excited about the new dialogue that's happening around intersectionality. I would posit that roughly 50% of people with disabilities are probably also female. I'm just going to take a guess, <laughs> maybe. I haven't studied it. I haven't looked it up, but I'm guessing it's probably true. Um, and so when we talk about inclusion in STEM, we need to be thinking about not just people with disabilities, not just girls, but also girls with disabilities. And how does that intersectionality change what their experience is? And that's an external change that's happening in the national dialogue that we are embracing and now looking to do our work differently. Um, What's interesting is that even with that positive change, we come across these kind of what I would call kind of broader institutional barriers, which is the way the museum field does its work. 
um, which is that we tend to talk about audiences in silos. And I'm wondering for those who are in science communication if you feel that too. So um, there are guidelines for the inclusion of people with disabilities in exhibits. There's guidelines for the inclusion of girls in exhibits. There's guidelines for the inclusion of people um, who are, um, have a Latino background in exhibits. There's guidelines for LGBTQ plus in exhibits, on and on and on. We took all of those inclusive guidelines together and we put them together in one document for our exhibits team. We looked for where there was common elements across the guidelines. And we came up with a list of 45 design criteria that we need to be thinking about in our exhibits, many of which conflict with one another. Clearly, the field and its silos ways of thinking about audiences has not kept up with the idea of intersectionality. And so we can't do that alone. That's something we need to do broadly across the whole field. And so what we're doing now is um, bringing in experts from across the museum field together so we can start to work on this problem collectively. So um, that's kind of just stories of how all these different pieces have worked in my work. Um, and I wanted to end with that because I wanted to give you ways of thinking about and framing the own, your own structures um, that are kind of posing barriers to the work that you do. And I would, um, just based on kind of some of the conversations we've all been having, what I want to do is kind of pose some questions and then give you moments to think about them yourselves. I think one of those kind of social structures are the existing frames and narratives that we use to talk about inclusive science communication. I think we need to have those, um, those ethical and moral um, frames that Kishore talked about, but I agree with him, they, they're not sufficient oftentimes. Um, and having them plus others, so I would say, you know, ethically and morally, we absolutely have to include people with disabilities in science communication. Um, but, but having that additional frame of better for everyone oftentimes helps to get people to the, recognize the ethical and moral dilemma that's there. And so um, it's an interesting thing for us to think about what are those dominant frames that are out there. Um, the pipeline being another one, right, and switching to agency. So, and what are some alternative frames um, that we could have that would help to bring other people along? And so I think that that's um, one place where we can talk about structures together as a group. Um, the other place, I think, is to talk um, and think about what are um, the structures that serve as barriers within your own practice, within your organization's practice, and then the, one, the barriers that exist externally as well. And I think that that's a great place for conversation amongst all of us because that's where collaborations can come together and that's why conferences like these are so important because um, they're things that we can work on collaboratively and collectively. <laughs>